audio levels. Good. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of On the Edge with LF Edge. Um, today's topic is Sharpening the Edge, the LF Edge Taxonomy and Framework. Um, before I introduce our host, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Attendees will be on mute throughout the session. However, we do have a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you have qu any questions at all that pop up throughout the presentation, feel free to type them in. Um, we are reserving some time at the end to talk through some of those questions and some of the questions will be, uh, some of the answers will be addressed uh, during real time uh, via typed from our panelists. So let's go ahead and introduce our panelists. Uh, we've got Jason Shepard, he's a VP of Ecosystem at Zadata. We have Vikram Sivach, he's a Principal Product Manager at Mobile EdgeX. And we have uh, Matt Trefiro, he's the CMO of Vapor.io. Thanks everyone for joining us. And without further ado, I'm gonna kick it off to Jason to get us started. All right, thanks, Jill. <clears throat> kind of introducing, um, uh, am I muted still? Hold on a sec. Can you guys hear me? We can hear yes, you. Yes, you okay, are not yeah. muted. Go, yes. go ahead. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it was saying I was muted. Um, cool, so, so we'll start off by kind of talking about you know, LF Edge as, as an overall organization. Um, so if you guys ha hadn't heard of LF Edge before, uh, we're an umbrella organization within Linux Foundation, very similar to how Cloud, Cloud Native Compute Foundation um, and the LF networking work. Uh, it's all about bringing together various different projects, uh, open source that, that um, are addressing various different components of the edge computing landscape. Um, we'll talk a little bit about those. And of course, we're gonna talk about the taxonomy in this webinar that we just uh, released through a white paper you'll be able to download today. Um, this is really about bringing together open source communities, you know, spanning a variety of different markets. Um, you know, we seek to harmonize across projects, um, you know, whenever there's, there's unnecessary overlap, of course, at the same time, we want to be inclusive and just kind of, you know, help, help the community uh, do what's right for the, the broader market and, and the people that are, you know, building you know, solutions with these uh, foundational elements. Um, you know, we're not trying to play favorites to hardware and silicon and cloud and, and, and protocols for connectivity or OS. It's really about these frameworks that unify all these different elements. Um, and we're, you know, seeking to co uh, collaborate with other consortiums and, and um, you know, just again, br bring together the broader ecosystem. And as mentioned, it's, it's an umbrella organization similar to others within Linux Foundation. So these are projects today, and there's a lot more information online uh, at lfedge.org, but these are the projects today. Um, you know, the, the, they're in various different stages based on, you know, when they've come in, uh, actually just added secure device onboarding uh, contrib contributed by Intel, um, I think in the, the last couple of weeks, um, there was a press release about that. But, you know, the projects uh, come in at different stages and then as they build up their communities, they, they advance you know, in stages and it's really about providing that structured governance and, and you know, Linux Foundation, of course, is all about providing that kind of vendor neutral hosting ground for us as communities. Uh, to 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 work and grow our our projects and and again seek to harmonize across projects as it makes sense but also be you know kind of the, the valuable independently but better together sort of story uh, that make, that makes sense in the broader ecosystem. Um, yeah, it's like it's crazy town out there in terms of the number of, of standards bodies and, and and specs and you know coming out of there and, and consortia and open source projects and this is just a sampling of them. Um, but you know again we, we're really seeking to to how do we minimize the, you know, as I call it, the undifferentiated heavy lifting that's happening out there in, in these markets, whether it's IoT or, or Edge or, or you know, even you know, bridging into the AI stuff, we're, we're kind of touching on all of them within LF Edge, of course, with that heavy you know, kind of edge component, edge computing component, but you know, we're all better off if we stop reinventing the middle and start focusing on the value add around the wheel. And so, so these are just you know, examples of the, the different ties that we're looking to make you know, over time as, as a broader community. So, okay, why another taxonomy? I mean, <laughs> the old joke in the standards world is, is like, uh, oh, we're gonna fix the standards problem with one more standard. Um, and, and, you know, the taxonomy, I mean, man, there's a lot of taxonomies out there for all, all um, you know, technology trends, but edge is no exception. And, you know, as a community, we, we decided, hey, we need, to, we need to get away from, you know, these, these taxonomies for edge computing that are like really biased to one market lens 
um, whether it's you know the IT side or the telcos you know uh, side, you know, service providers. Um, it could be the operations side. I mean, there's consumer. Uh, some people say, oh, there's an enterprise edge, there's a consumer edge, there's an industrial edge. But actually, what it is is it's one continuum, and then you apply different tools and different you know domain knowledge on top of that continuum, recognizing the inherent technical trade-offs. And so, you know, we got to get away from these, you know, ambiguous or I'd say loaded terms like near and far and thin and thick. And, you know, like, what does that mean? Like, where is near and far? And, and um, you, know, uh, you know, near and far to a telco is actually opposite of what an end consumer would think. A telco thinks that, you know, would say near edge is closer, uh, close to their core infrastructure and a far edge is out where the user is. And the user, I'd think that the near edge is like right where I am and the far edge is out by the telco. Let's talk about absolutes. Um, so this new taxonomy that we'll run through, so myself and, and Vikram and, and, and Matt will we'll talk about this um, taxonomy and, and some key considerations at the various edges, and, and Matt will get into some deployment models and, and use cases and how state of the edge is, is, is a, a really good resource for more information. We'll talk about the project, all that. But the, the taxonomy is based on inherent technical trade-offs. If you focus on absolute trade-offs as you span through the continuum, you're always right. You know, you, you're always like, you know, is it on a WAN or LAN? Is it on in a secure net area or not? You know, is it is it capable of running abstraction or is it not? And so you'll see that in this, um, the, the taxonomy and you also, you know, in, at length, the community white paper goes into this in great detail. Yeah, these are absolutes that you cannot misinterpret like like thin, near and far, thin and thick and all that. And we, we do map those terms to the these new um, breakdowns. And the goal was to create a, a like a comprehensive, um, taxonomy that, that kind of addresses the key considerations. I mean, it's 30 pages. It would be like a monster if we try to accomplish everything. And we'll evolve it over time as a community. But it really, you think, provides a good foundation to then take the language that's specific to your industry that matters to you to build on top of those absolute trade-offs. And then you, you, know, you kind of you know, create your own language on top, but, but um, there's still sort of like a groundwork to, to build off of. So that's, that was kind of why we felt like there was a new taxonomy was needed. And, you know, kind of getting into, you know, LF Edge you know, a little bit more um, before we get into the taxonomy. I and mean, this is ultimately about abstracting uh, various different elements of value add uh, from, um, you know, the, the other, the rest of the solution stack. So kind of the principles of, of, of edge computing scale, any kind of, and this kind of applies everywhere, but we need to have, you know, data. That's the last thing we want to virtualize. You know, if we can, if you focus on trusted data, everything else follows. Uh, data is your number one resource next to your people, you know, in your, in your business. Um, and, uh, you know, data, uh, applications, domain knowledge, you don't want these things hard coupled to your underlying infrastructure. And when's the last time your ERP system managed your PCs? You know, you don't do that. But in a lot of the new uh, technology uh, stacks that are being brought up, uh, you know, in the early days of these markets, they tend to have everything sort of mixed together trying to provide you the one-stop shop, but what we really need is a consistent foundation that then you apply the best tools to. So necessarily unique hardware and software, um, you know, the domain knowledge, and then that, that consistent foundation, um, uh, recognizing that there's a continuum and there's different tools depending on where you are in the continuum, um, that's, that's really important. We'll, again, we'll talk about those trade-offs as we go and, and Vikram will get into great detail on the, the service provider edge as an example. Um, you want to decouple your data the moment it's created um, from any given backend service, whether it's in the cloud or backend. It's not to say the clouds are bad, the clouds are doing awesome stuff, but you wanna make sure that, that if you decouple the data, untether it the moment it's created, then all permutations work from edge to cloud, whether you wanna send it to one cloud, multiple clouds, um, you know, on-prem, you know, otherwise. And, and so that's another key point. That's like why EdgeX and Fledge and other projects you know, are, are focused on kind of that, that you know, decoupling point, that double translation you know, engine. Um, you know, cloud native principles. I want to extend cloud native as far uh, down the continuum as possible. Um, the paper gets into this and we talk about, you know, edge native a bit in the paper. That's a term that's been popping up and, and you know, edge native important to realize is that edge native is an edge native app must have the cloud in mind. If you're an app running at the edge and you don't have the cloud in mind, then you're basically just a legacy app that's running at the edge. Uh, you must have that continuum, continuum in mind, but you've optimized that app for the edge. Cloud native, you know, loosely coupled microservices, easy to kind of replace and update, you know, on its own without taking the whole system down, all this stuff that, that folks know from a, like a CI, CD, all that. But also recognize that as you move left in this continuum that we're about to share, 
there are trade-offs. You know, if you're running time critical applications, like if the message doesn't get there exactly at this time, all the time, you know, like hard real time, deterministic, you're probably not going to do a bunch of you know, modular flexible architecture. You're going to go embedded. Um, if it's constrained hardware, you can't support these kind of things. So it's, it's recognize those tools, but the more places you can put cloud native, and this is a key point of, of LFEDGE as we collaborate, provide that framework, that underlying framework and, and tool sets that you can use, and then you focus on the value around the wheel. So you know, really important you know, principles, I think, uh, and, you know, kind of to live by as you build out your edge solutions. And, and that's just like for the basics. But the real goal here is, is to get into this notion of interconnected ecosystems. And so, you know, step one is just like, get me some data flowing from the physical world if you're doing IoT. And then of course, there's, there's all kinds of cool use cases in just general edge. And again, Matt will touch on some of those, but the real potential is this notion of all kinds of new business models that span all of these different theaters and then some you know, the crossover between, you know, a smart city and, and vehicles and, and um, you know, within the city and the people within the city and then into your home. But of course, it's all about privacy first and foremost. So if you are okay with something from a privacy standpoint and the same kind of plumbing, that open plumbing is, you can help with this, you know, the trust and all that. Um, if you're okay with it and you get value, then, then there's all kinds of new things that you're gonna start seeing from a um, you know, balancing out uh, you know, you know, uh, privacy and value in terms of new business models. How do retailers cross over into the home? How do, you, how do you see throughout your supply chain how things are going and then cross into the retail and into the home and just everything. I mean, this is where the money is made long-term is interconnecting ecosystems and you must have an open trusted foundation to get there. And uh, you know, imagine if one company owned the internet is, is kind of like you know, where we're at, you know, a couple companies. We must have an open, so this is another really big re reason for LFED. So that's just some kind of principles that, that, that I think that you know, are important to think about as you sort of build solutions and, and then we'll, we'll get into the taxonomy and, and of course the paper gets into more, much more detail. So I'll kind of quickly introduce the taxonomy and then I'll hand it over to Vikram. So, okay, so this, this is in that white paper, um, you know, as mentioned, it's, it's, you know, it goes into great detail um, but but as, and as, as I set it up, this is all about various different buckets that are based on hard trade-offs. Uh, we did have to call them something, um, but these words were cho chosen carefully based on a series of factors. And as you traverse through this continuum, um, there are definitive trade-offs that d delineate between one um, you know, edge and, and the next one, you know, edge as a category, so to speak. So of course, on one side, you've got, you know, uh, you know, the north side, so to speak, you've got you know, you know, massively scalable centralized data centers, you know, in the cloud. Um, there's, there's, in, when you talk about public clouds, there's tens, you know, in the, in the world that are gonna matter, you know, long-term, uh, you know. And, and then on the other side, you've got just highly constrained microcontroller-based devices distributed everywhere in the physical world. Um, those, you know, over time, you know, set of, compared to the tens in the public cloud sense, there's, there's eventually trillions of those devices everywhere. Um, and then there's, a, there's kind of an exponential scale in between. You, you start to see, you see tens and you know, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and then millions and then you know, eventually billions and trillions. I mean, that's the kind of scale. And the paper talks about that, you know, generally speaking. And then generally speaking, everything gets more, it's not to say that it's trivial up on the, on the, the right side, the, the, the centralized side, it, it, there's a lot of challenges as well, but in terms of hardware and software customization, you know, uh, the resource constraints, you know, the scale, as I mentioned, everything grows the further you get left, closer to the physical world. So the hardware, because it gets more constrained, you, see, you need more customization. The paper talks about the fact that you need unique form factors. Every constrained device is, is generally a different you know, kind of product. Like a toaster is a little bit different than a lamp in a car. And, and then on the right, you have more consistent infrastructure, but of course there's some unique needs around you know, the, the radio infrastructure and all that. So that's one key thing. And then of course on, on the right, these resources tend to be shared by um, a lot of uh, users is great value to centralization. In fact, if we could centralize everything, that'd be awesome. You know, it's very efficient, but at the same time, there's, there's unique needs on the left side. Um, you know, and so I'll kind of talk through some of the other ones as we go. So, so got the, the centralized data centers on the right. You've got this internet edge, which is basically, you know, kind of the, that point where you flip over on the other side of that, that core pipe of the internet. Um, you know, uh, Vikram will talk more about this in detail. I'm just going to quickly go through service provider edge. And then you've got um, in the service provider edge, you've got uh, people that are including the clouds, the telcos, you know, uh, CDN network providers, you have some new 
uh, new business models hopping up around these, these peering sites. Um, literally where we're moving compute, the regional edge is still multiple hops from the users, but it's at least uh, on the other side of the internet edge and it's a little closer and you're, you're kind of reducing latency a bit more. And then of course, if you move compute even further down that, that network, right to the, to the last point before the, the, the last mile network, that, that WAN, that's the access edge. So literally I'm putting a, you know, a modular data center at the bottom of a cell tower as an example. You know, or, or you know, it could be a wireline operator just as well. And so, yeah, Vikram will talk about that more in detail, but the key between this service provider edge bucket and the user edge bucket is that they're, they're divided by a last mile network. And the reason why that's important is there's a difference between latency sensitive applications and latency critical applications. If I'm a latency sensitive application like streaming video, I'm gonna to want to probably you know, run that on the service provider edge. I, they do today, I and mean, we, we do today because I can serve it up to lots of people. If I'm a latency critical application, I mean, if your video goes out, it's annoying, but you know, no one gets hurt. Latency critical application, like deploying your airbag in your car or the brakes, I probably, well, I'm always gonna run that locally, always gonna be done com compute wise you know, in that vehicle. And so we see this blend of services. If I'm in a vehicle, my airbag will always be done at the user edge, you know, literally in the vehicle, it's latency critical, but serving up different services like infotainment, you know, coordinating cars, you know, with, with small cells in a, in, at an intersection as they approach, you know, an augmented service, that will definitely be done by the service provider edge. It's not like, it's not the same as pressing the brakes. Um, so this is why it's really important to look at that first delineation between the service provider edge, which is you know, those shared resources, and, and, and we'll talk more about that, and the user edge. These are end users and enterprises divided by the last mile network. And the reason this little angle is here is that if a service provider puts CPE equipment you know, on premise, then that edge kind of bleeds into the on-prem world. If I'm a user, an, an enterprise, and I build a private data center that I own and operate, well, then I bleed kind of upstream a little bit. And so there's not, there's, there's a little blur here and we talk about that in the paper. Okay, so I'll get, I'll get into this and I wanna hand it to Vikram. So on-prem data center edge, this is on the other side of the last mile network. That's the first tier in the user edge. These are traditional data centers. Um, these are things we've had a long time in buildings. Maybe I have a micro -modular, modular data center next to my building. I, I, I'm kind of, kind of expanding that way. You know, reasonably scalable within the confines of the available power and cooling and real estate and all that. Not nearly as scalable as the, the massively you know, scalable centralized data centers up in the cloud, um, but, but still good stuff. And they use the same tools pretty much. Now we're seeing an evolution with Kubernetes taking the world by storm of Kubernetes being extended down. You have to you know, then consider the scale factor in terms of clustering and, and distributed clusters and stuff like that. And so there's some evolution of tools needed, but generally kind of the same stuff as you've seen for years. Uh, evolving in the market. You know, again, not, I'm not trying to trivialize it. It's just, you know, it's, it's more consistent data center, center you know, infrastructure. And it's physically secure. Very key point here on the on-prem data center edge is like all the other edges, generally speaking, they're all physically secure. I have a network perimeter and a physical, physical security perimeter. So when I go left, even one more hop, again, these are those hard inherent trade-offs. The smart device edge is two things. I am still capable of running apps because I have enough memory and you know, kind of resources to support abstraction of some sort, but I'm outside of a physically secure data center. So those are the two criteria. And again, the paper goes into great depth. We called it the smart device edge, you know, because it's not just about IoT, it's you know, all the PCs, the client devices, like you know, PCs, tablets, smartphones, you name it. Those are those are the the client devices at the smart device edge that, that you know, have very well established paradigms with Windows and iOS and Android and all that. They tend to be uh, more download centric. Uh, of course, you know, if you're doing cloud gaming, you're, you're, you want really low latency for, for upload for, for control. But, but client devices like smartphones tend to be more download centric. And then this smart device edge also includes headless devices used for kind of IoT use cases. Hubs, routers, gateways, even a server, if it's deployed outside of a physically secure data center. So that, that whole notion of, you know, the, 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 the smart device edge, it is not just about gateways. Too many people talk about, oh, it's just gateways out there for IoT. No, it's any kind of compute resources that can still run apps that's outside of a physically secure space. You know, I don't own the network. And so that smart device edge is, is key. And then when you go one hop over the constrained device edge, and it's about 256 megs of memory, I can no longer run um, you know, abstraction, virtualization, containerization, or, you know, something like a, you know, like iOS or Android or whatever. I can't do apps. I have to go embedded. And now everything's really complex. I've got custom over the air update tools for everything. 
you know, very, very unique form factors. And, and, and again, the paper goes into great detail. So, so a lot of, you know, I want to you know, hand it over, but you know, a lot of thought went into this as a community to make sure that we're talking about, you know, hard trade-offs. So real quick, I've talked about a lot of this, so I, I want to hand it to Vikram. So we want to extend cloud native principles as far as, this is about the user edge. Um, on the user side, we want to keep extending those cloud native principles down, but also recognize the inherent trade-offs. As I mentioned, if I'm doing time or safety critical workloads, I'm not going to be you know, focused on making a super modular and flexible. I'm going to be focused on it. It always does this right. Um, you know, recognize those resource constraints. When I'm outside of the, the secure data center, like I'm into the smart device edge and the constrained device edge, I have no physical or network security perimeter. I don't know if I have a firewall. I, I need to have similar principles in terms of orchestration and security, but you can't just copy and paste Kubernetes. You can't copy and paste those data center tools. This is why, you know, Project Eve that we're working on exists. You know, there's some really cool stuff happening with Open Horizon and some, you know, some of these other projects, um, you know, that, 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 that how do you kind of deal with this uh, uh, distributed nature? Um, you, you need zero trust security because you don't have that perimeter. You need uh, zero touch install capability in terms of, I don't necessarily know about you know, IT skills, I know how to, you know, to install, you know, a surveillance system or install sensing stuff on a factory floor. Um, you know, legacy connectivity protocols, uh, this is why, you know, EdgeX and Fledge are, are, are really important. Thousands of protocols out in the IT world or in the OT world, um, you know, maybe tens that matter in the IT world. Uh, I got a mixture of legacy and mod modern applications, just like I do up in the, up in the, the centralized data centers, but not only do I have to support legacy apps plus modern containerized apps, but I also um, need to support mixed criticality where I have a mixture of latency sensitive and latency uh, critical and, and even safety critical apps. Uh, or, or, and then of course, we can't forget that it's not like all compute happens on fancy servers in the back end. We're gonna see more and more compute happening at the constrained device edge with things like you know, tiny ML. Um, just in the past six months, we've seen a lot of people talking about that. Um, fixed function apps generally, um, but just it's, it's really important to just think compute's going to be happening everywhere across the continuum. It's just going to be different levels of compute based on the capability of those devices and systems. So with that, I'll hand it over to Vikram um, to, to get into more detail on the, uh, uh, the uh, service provider edge. Thanks, Jason. And uh, that was a great start. You actually explained the user edge and Great detail. Can we just go back uh, to the service provider? Um, and sorry, you have to do this yep. for us. Uh, you took that responsibility. But the uh, <laughs> the idea here, I think, as Jason mentioned, um, uh, we don't need to reinvent a lot of things. We can borrow learnings from public cloud. Um, but there's one trend which is happening, which is the volume, right? Like public clouds have um, generated a lot of wealth on multiplexing across compute, right? Then same thing if you look at service provider engine, how access edges are coming through, it's not gonna be just one DC, it's gonna be thousands of these DCs. So although we can borrow cloud native principles, but there are some subtleties of how this will work, right? When you run these distributed workloads. So if you look at it, the markets are evolving, there are peering companies which are evolving to service some of these uh, things. We do know the consumption um, from last 10 years on um, video. Right, like we know that operators have been traditionally working with uh, you, Netflix, YouTube, and just because the need is there, right? The, the idea of having some cash um, nearby provides that experience to Netflix users, right? Um, and Netflix is pretty smart about figuring out what to download on that cash at midnight, right? For its consumers to use it. So we can borrow that, some of those stuff, what some of those design principles, and I'll go in a little bit detail and paper goes in a little bit detail. Um, but just for, for, the, for the people to understand, we, we, we try to build a continuum as um, Jason laid out. We're gonna use the same sort of tools, maybe a little bit modifications around the distribution of these workloads and different criteria, which uh, Jason mentioned here. But at the end of the day, we want to work in harmony. There is nothing like um, anything will work in isolation. These boundaries will overlap, right? So if you see there, their service provider edge actually overlaps in certain things. These are for private LD markets where an operator might actually serve uh, an enterprise with the compute too, right? So thinking about that, it, it's just an abstraction. Now we all know if I actually uh, take a detailed view on service provider edge, possibly we can have 10 different layers into it. 
So don't think of this as like, um, we have done justice to everything, but we have done justice in regards to people can have common conversation, whether it's a telco um, uh, guy talking to a cloud native guy, they can talk about the same terms and the same language and probably agree to that, right? Um, so let's jump into the other side uh, where um, Jason, you'll have to move slides for me. One more. That's right. So we, we identified a few trends in the paper. Um, we think that people in the cloud native world have solved a bunch of problems. Um, and the form factor of how these things work today is that people are deploying microservices, container workloads, and they're moving workloads seamlessly across regions in hyperscalers. We believe that structure which exists today is pretty good. We can take that backend and port it right onto um, an edge site in service provider. Now, we would strongly believe that will exist, that will continue to flourish um, because there's high value to it. Um, as Jason and others have highlighted, that there is continuous integration principles, there's continuous deployment structures. This allows tremendous scale for web scale companies to go and upgrade these thousands of sites in service provider. So they will continue to leverage these tools, right? So if you look in the subsections of that, we believe that the continuous delivery structures would exist um, at these thousands of distributed sites. We don't generally believe that, let's say if you're running a workload in an access edge, right, near a CEO, that you're gonna be developing code there or actually doing integration exercises. So it will be more towards robust applications ready to go for deployment, right? Now, uh, people who actually will exploit this um, edges will have sensitivity around what they need to offload at these edge sites. It could be latency, it could be privacy. Both these are available today, right? I mean, that's what, let's say, the example I mentioned before, Netflix and YouTube are using. They typically get so 30 milliseconds when they actually sit inside an operator, right? And the experience is awesome. Now, if you look at next generation applications, which would be more immersive, there'll be AR games. Um, these immersive applications will need even more stricter latency constraints and they'll have those. So latency sensitivity is bound to increase as more and more consumer brands look for these angles to promote their products, right? So same principle applies with privacy too. Maybe I have a GDPR regulation where I don't want my data to be stored by a different country, right? So these, uh, these structures would allow us to uh, have data sovereignty within the network boundary, within the country boundary or city boundaries, right? Now, if you go a little bit further, um, the multi-cloud orchestration scheme is pretty clear today in the world, right? You could run a KDS workload and you can run the same workload across multiple hyperscalers. You don't really need to um, use the, the tools which, uh, which create a lock-in structure there, right? You could stay neutral to those. So similar principles you can borrow from that world, right? But also the serverless market which has evolved in the public cloud may not directly apply to a guy who is, um, has a mobile phone with them, right? So the, the models will change a little bit. The serverless will mean a little bit differently because now you're actually looking at what back, back end to uh, start where based on actual demand, right? Of number of devices connected. Within that device, which application are we trying to scale, right? So this is what we believe that the new models will be. Um, and we highlight that in the paper, um, that, that structure. Um, we do believe that we can learn a lot from content distribution companies, how they adopted to caches in the operator, how they operate today, right? But that has been always a downlink principle, right? You're consuming data from an internet, from a cloud to the device. More and more often now we are seeing the uplink data, which is like um, you're running a factory, you're running video cameras around that. This uplink data has more sensitivity on the uplink side, and it has also more privacy needs, right? So things like that will change, but the design principles of how to distribute content, how to manage that will be retained, right? Um, now, again, this is great because this all talks about backend orchestration, where the workloads will go, but still the end user devices, the end applications have to discover these, right? So there'll be some uh, innovation around discovery of these edge apps and highly likely it will be based on data, like um, how near am I? to the site which is serving that content? Or what is the actual quality of experience a device is getting? Maybe the site near me is compromised, so maybe I'll place it somewhere else, right? So that will, of course, change. 
Now, one important thing which is happening thanks to 5G is that operators that want to get engaged in this value chain where they have high value metadata. They have metadata around your location, uh, identity, um, and also about the quality of service constructs they have. These operators have built structures for preventing that data. Uh, and also, we often don't hear sort of cellular control planes get, getting hijacked, right? Because they are actually very secure environments. But at the same time, we do not want um, privacy to be breached. We don't want identity of people or where they are located to be abused in a way. So the, the systems of evolution would be something like um, people would not be pointed to directly um, saying, okay, this X user is actually here. That's not what, what, is, what, what will happen. It'll be more like X number of users are in this region, seems like the demand is increasing. Let's spin up a backend in that region. That's what metadata consumption model means, right? Um, Again, it is often said, um, you know, application backend will follow a user. That's fundamentally flawed, right? Because it will be very expensive to do that, right? The best way to look at it is, okay, I'm going to have so many new users in a site. If that threshold increases or at a periodicity, then I'll spin up a backend. So application mobility will work in cohesion with device mobility, but not, not independent, right? The, these are like not, uh, okay, device moves, application move, that doesn't happen. Um, and for the last part, the federation structures will happen. Whether we like it or not, there are companies in the US, Equinix, Vapor, they're developing structures around, hey, I, I had the terminal point from the mobile network. How can I distribute it across the peer, peer side? So these peering structures will help evolve. Now, some of the operators will actually make um, initiators even further deep because they might actually ex exercise that peering on their own on the last mile side. But that evolution is bound to happen. So this, these are the few architectural trends we pointed out. Um, oh. Okay, I think you're moving backwards. But let me just show you a suggested application deployment, what that means. We're not talking about really how you should be running your 5G network or your VNFs. We're talking about application workloads coming behind those network functions, right? So what would be the structure is what we are describing here. This describes a model where a bunch of the uh, devices on UCC on the left, um, they want to access the right edge app, right? And these access edges, which we call them zone one and zone two, sit within an operator boundary or a service provider boundary, right? And then there is a, a, another edge app, which is actually sitting on a peering fabric. So let's say people uh, have stateful context around two operators then they would actually be orchestrated on a peering fab, uh, site. But again, this is not gonna be happening like, I'm just gonna pick up any application from public cloud and put it there. The, the, the form factor of Edge app would be pretty lightweight, right? Because there's limited compute on that access edge. Um, so this actually shows you a state uh, model where the critical states, let's say you wanna commit something, um, those are already commoditized in public cloud. So you're gonna continue using those services there. Now, if you want to accelerate an ML workload on a service provider's edge, you're gonna take that part of your um, uh, application and deploy it on the edge app, right? The structures within a platform which will allow that will provide dynamic scale. That means they'll be able to move these applications um, freely, right? Depending on the user demand. And also the, the device will have something underneath them, right? Which will allow them to discover these edge apps. So there's certain key things which paper highlights, which, should, which we should go through. And then I think we, we probably will evolve this over a period of time. But this is the way we think um, these four edges which we're talking about will evolve. Now, this doesn't talk about the real devices edge, which um, Jason highlighted, but there is a structure there too of this continuous uh, integration and deployment, which you can follow through until a physical boundary, right? So thinking of that way would help um, you know, this communication around how these things will evolve or edge will evolve. So I'll just finish this off with one last slide, um, which essentially talks about, um, this paper doesn't talk about KDS or container orchestration structures or how you want to deploy virtual workloads. Um, there's a lot of data in the Linux Foundation itself for you to actually consume and figure it out. What it does elevate is a bunch of things which uh, Akrena has been doing for the last one year or so. 
on standardizing an application discovery piece, which is how do we figure out um, the right place to go from a device? So there, there's an actual um, white paper around those APIs too, which is goes in harmony with the Linux Foundation architecture paper. Um, but it's, the idea is very simple. Um, this backend discovery engine would be actually figuring out what is the optimal uh, site to go to based on layer four quality of measurements, which is a pretty standard way developers can consume and also the nearness, right? And that would allow a healthy discovery structures across these mobile devices. Um, so with that, I will I'll stop. And I think I'm gonna pass it to Matt to summarize um, the taxonomy and the deployments. Matt? Excellent, excellent, yes. Good, hello everybody. Um, so if you think about the, uh, the edge, not as a completely isolated uh, part of the of the internet, but as a continuum that stretches, you know, all the way from today's cloud centralized data centers to the everything on the on the user edge, including the devices and the gateways and even on-prem servers. And as uh, as a provider of an application, um, you have choices about where you will deploy different workloads along that continuum. And there's lots of trade-offs to be made about where where those workloads uh, are deployed. Some of the obvious ones are like uh, cost, uh, uh, maintainability, uh, you know, how, does, how do you integrate software upgrades into the life cycle, um, uh, resilience, uh, speed, cost, things like that. You know, one of the, the, the ways to think about this is, you know, the big change that's driving a lot of edge computing is uh, we're moving from a world where it's mostly humans talking to machines to a world that machines are talking to machines. And there's going to be billions of them. They're going to be generating data, lots of data, 24-7. And the, the commercial value uh, uh, arguably would deliver uh, from the companies that can process that data most effectively and most quickly to enable uh, good decisions about where a robotic arm moves or whether a car breaks or turns a corner uh, and so on. And so I think uh, thinking about where uh, your workloads need to run, uh, you know, as Jason mentioned, a really good example is the autonomous car. So you obviously don't want to have the airbag or the brakes dependent on some function working uh, in in, uh, in a, a cloud server uh, that might be thousands of miles away. You probably don't want that, well, you definitely don't want that even in a, in a server that might be tens of miles away. You actually want that on the device itself, that control loop. But you can inform that control loop with decision support that comes from other locations. So for example, an autonomous car can't see around a corner, uh, but a, uh, a network uh, uh, of, of servers at the service fighter edge could be aware of cars that are around the corners, could inform uh, a car, and then there could be a more gradual braking and approaching an intersection, for example, and that improves the user experience. Um, you can go to the next slide. So, you know, one of the questions we get asked a lot are what are the use cases that are enabled by edge computing and the LF edge projects? And, and I want to draw your attention to the, the, the lower box here first. Um, there are a set of enabling technologies and to a very real extent, uh, where we are today in the evolution of edge computing is largely around creating these enabling technologies. So if you look at the projects in LF edge today, they're mostly around uh, creating these platforms uh, atop which we can build these use cases that actually are meaningful to, to end users. Uh, and so if you look at things like, uh, you know, network function virtualization, uh, the creation of, of uh, how that enables, for example, 5G networks, which create, you know, a much more robust communication path across that last mile network, which enables the service provider edge to actually provide low latency workload support and so on. So all of this emerges with a, a platform upon which you can build these these other capabilities and you know to some extent uh, these are the the work uh, the workloads and use cases that we see out creating demand in the marketplace today uh, you know whether it's autonomous devices such as drones doing infrastructure in, inspection or providing decision support to drivers or autonomous driving uh, or supporting robotic factories and so on uh, to immersive experiences you know uh, being able to to provide augmented or virtual reality um, uh, over a last mile network so you're not uh, tethered to a, a local computer um, and it's dynamic and it can involve uh, input from other devices uh, in real time. And then of course, the, the internet of things, which is gonna be driven by you know, billions of sensors, both direct and indirect uh, types of sensors uh, that will need to be analyzed. And the 
total of these things. And the vision of, of LF Edge is to create the, the enabling technologies that uh, we shouldn't be competing around uh, because they're the basic infrastructure that allows us to build these value added applications on top. You can go to the next slide. So in addition to being the chief marketing officer of Vapor.io, I also co-chair a project in LF Edge called State of the Edge. This is a, uh, a growth project, top level project at um, the Linux Foundation. And um, it's kind of an unusual project in that uh, it, it doesn't have any code uh, or not really. And the, the path, the journey of State of the Edge to the Linux Foundation came through uh, a working group of the State of the Edge that's called the Open Glossary of Edge Computing. And that's a resource that I direct you to as being potentially most relevant to the topic today. Uh, so the Open Glossary of Edge Computing started with a very simple principle, and that is um, in the same way that we shouldn't be competing against, uh, you know, around like basic infrastructure tools that we all need to build, uh, we shouldn't be competing around which terms we use to describe what we do in the industry. So we set out to build a glossary, one that was open, that was run like an open source project. The Linux Foundation, to their credit, had the vision to induct that uh, as a project. Um, and now the State of the Edge has taken on uh, 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 a, a pretty uh, large mandate, which is to publish free shareable research and to be the steward of a lot of this terminology, but to apply open source principles to that. Jason. All right, great. Thanks, Vikram and Matt. So um, I'll summarize, you know, things and then we'll kind of get in, into questions and answers and whatnot. I'd say we've been answering a couple in the in the chat window. So if you do have questions, um, you know, definitely pop them into the, the Q&A box and, and we'll answer them as we go uh, and, and have a little time for, for um, discussion at the end, you know, through that, uh, those questions in the, in the Q&A box. Um, so as we've been saying, you know, this, the taxonomy is you know, out, the white paper will be um, available online today. Uh, mentioned, you know, one of the questions was about the slides. So we'll publish this recording in the slides through the Linux Foundation. Um, and, um, you know, when you look at LF Edge as an overall uh, umbrella organization. We've got these collection of projects. We're at nine projects today. So, so uh, Intel's contribution of secure device onboard, as I mentioned, just came in. Uh, Open Horizon came in recently. Um, you know, the whole point here again is to sort of you know, seek to harmonize across these projects that are, are valuable independently, but you know, the goal would be to make them better together. Uh, so this lays out the projects across that continuum that we've been talking about, you know, the taxonomy and the paper and, you know, various different stages, but um, you know, and, 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 you know, Crano as one of the anchor projects as an example, you know, it's a little bit different. So, so as Matt said, you know, State of the Edge is, is providing that really critical you know, research and reports and the glossary project, which a lot of the new terms in the taxonomy, you know, we're, we're putting into the, the glossary so that we've got correlation there. We want to go drive, you know, kind of that thought leadership across the industry. Um, Acrano is uh, similar in a sense that it's less of a heavy code project, like a, a open source, you know, um, you know, code project. Uh, there is code, you know, in Acrano, but also there's this notion of these blueprints that that um, that community is addressing in terms of kind of starting at the service provider edge, you know, some of the telco focus and whatnot, but expanding down to uh, that user edge and, and how do you deploy consistent infrastructure um, across that continuum and do a lot of the things that, that Vikram mentioned in terms of you know kind of optimizing you know this 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 the, the experiences for for end users or any kind of consumer, uh, enterprise or otherwise. Um, so Crano is a little bit different in that sense, but then of course the rest of the projects are, are you know, very traditional um, open source projects. There's code associated with it, of course, you know, architectures and and um, you know, SDO is is I'm just kind of kind of go uh, bottom of the top. SDO is um, uh, a new project as mentioned that is all about how do I uh, deliver uh, or how do I kind of bootstrap devices in the field. Intel's um, been developing this for, for a while, actually collaborating with ARM. Um, it's, it's a new, based on a, a new um, spec that's emerging in the FIDO Alliance around how do I um, uh, you know, do late binding of identity to a device within um, the, the, uh, the broader supply chain. Um, so there's there's a lot of folks kind of doing that zero touch provisioning model today, including you know, Project Eve does that. But we're also very interested in this notion of how can we standardize that more. So that's that's a, you know, a great thing that Intel's been leading uh, in collaboration with a variety of folks. Open Horizon is all about um, you know delivering containers out into um, into the field. So there's a there's a kind of a server component and then an edge component. How do I deliver um, you know applications? Uh, Eve is a project uh, that that um, you know, is really uh, around kind of do for the IoT um, uh, edge, uh, IoT component of that smart device edge, what Android did for mobile. So create kind of like a, a common foundation for, um, 
you know, any kind of deployment, whether it's on a gateway or a server or otherwise, like, you know, this OS layer that has all these security functions and I can run virtual machines and containers and whatnot. And, and actually could be, could be tied into Open Horizon. We're, we're talking about that within the community. Uh, Betel is, is kind of a, a, a cloud to, to, to edge sort of a, a application framework. There's some, some analytics components in there. It was contributed by Baidu. Home Edge is, is, you know, how do I develop um, kind of an ecosystem around servers in the home that create different value added services, including tying into AI and, and whatnot in, in the home. Um, uh, uh, Fledge is a, a project around, um, you know, kind of connectivity up, up through analytics, uh, you know, really targeted at the industrial space, contributed by Dynamic. Um, and uh, that, uh, you know, they've been, you know, doing some really cool stuff, including with, with Google around TensorFlow and whatnot. And then EdgeX is, I, I actually <laughs> I've got a soft spot for EdgeX. I helped get that started about, about three years ago and, and it's really, um, you know, taken off and, and you know, doing great. I think it just hit like 5 million downloads or so out in the, in the open market and really cool, you know, project um, that, that, and the reason why EdgeX and Fledge, there is some commonality in terms of the goals, but, you know, EdgeX, you know, this is kind of exactly why the, with a continuum exists, EdgeX takes a little bit more of a, a super modular approach to make it very, very flexible. Um, whereas Fledge has taken, it's, it's modular, but it's taken a little bit more of a, um, uh, you know, optimized for more constrained devices. Uh, even though EdgeX is very light in footprint, there's just trade-offs that you have to make. And so there's some kind of unique architectural um, considerations that are made between you know, all of these projects. Um, and so there's, there's room for a lot of these different flavors because the complexity is in this continuum. And then, as I said, you know, as we've all been saying, we will try to make them more, you know, um, harmonized over time, while also recognizing the inherent trade-offs, which are really well explained in the white paper, because of the, you know, just because of the, the, the complexities across those overall continuum. So I'll summarize real quick, so we have some time for for, for Q and A. Um, yeah, again, LF Edge, we're here to try to you know build an open interoperable framework um you know the real potential here is not you know doing as i mean we should always start small let's not get crazy here but um you know, start small find a use case and go solve like a business value give a customer a better experience or whatever but longer term you got to be really careful if you're architecting today to not architect yourself in a corner and prevent yourself from getting to the real potential and that that is this notion of interconnected ecosystems you know, X to X to X to X, any combination of business and consumer and, and otherwise, um, all these use cases spanning. Of course, privacy and, and IP protection is number one, but if you can manage privacy while delivering entirely new value chains, this is what it's about long-term. And you must have open, and this is again why we think that what we're doing in LF Edge as a community and all the work that we're doing, working with other you know, communities is super, super important. Um, the second, you know, summary point, you know, hey, this is about a holistic taxonomy. Let's get away from, you know, near, far, thin and thick, um, you know, myopic views from one industry. Um, you know, try to have a balanced view. Couldn't cover everything in 30 pages. Uh, it, it'd be a, it'd be like a really long one. As Vikram said, there's some really good detail, but there's a lot more. We didn't email on the taxonomy. We weren't going to go into like micro levels, but we will keep involving this taxonomy, keep evolving the um, the white paper, you'll see more, uh, you know, talk in future white papers, you know, as we evolve it around how the projects are working together, et cetera. But this kind of lays that groundwork. And then again, it's, it's really about how, how can people have that common foundation that then you can go apply your industry specific language on top. And, and that kind of leads to the last point that there, there's one edge computing continuum. There, there's not an industrial edge, a consumer edge, an enterprise edge or whatever, whatever, whatever. We want one cake with lots of flavings of flavors of icing and sprinkles. You know, it's like one continuum um, that you apply different tool sets, different domain knowledge, different necessarily unique apps and, and, and hardware and all that, depending on the needs of the use case, depending on trade-offs between, you know, latency sensitive and latency critical, you know, the, the needs to always run the process in the OT world, like uptime is number one. You know, uptime and safety is number one in, in an operations world, the OT world. Whereas security and data, you know, uh, you know privacy and, and governance and stuff like that is number one in IT world. And they're, they're, they're closely related. It's not like OT doesn't care about security, but they care about security to maximize uptime and safety. And so it's just different concerns, you know, out there. And, and, and the paper, I think, does a really good job of kind of outlining that at a high level. And then, of course, you know, you can get into a bunch of details from there. So uh, download the paper, check out LF Edge. I'll hand it over to Jill to just kind of wrap up. I know we've got about 10 minutes for, um, for Q&A if, if we've got some other questions. But, you know, th you know again, thanks to, you know, Vikram and Matt. And, and uh, you know, I think this was a good, good discussion. So, you know, Jill, go ahead. 
Yeah, great. Thanks, guys. Um, this was a really awesome presentation. We had some really good questions come in. Um, I know a lot of these were answered already via text, uh, but we can go ahead and, and discuss some of them. We do have a couple of new ones that just came in, so I'll read those out loud. Um, OpenStack has edge software efforts as well and now is described as being a member and participant in LF Edge. Can you describe how the efforts of the two groups overlap and how you see them cooperating together? I'm glad to chat with Vikram. Do you want to chat about it? Um, sorry, I was, I was lost here, Jill. Uh, which particular projects are we? Uh, uh, so this is OpenStack. So, so uh, op OpenStack, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll throw in you know, quick answers. So yeah, there's, you know, OpenStack's doing, you know, um, you know edge uh, focus, you know, tends to be more on the kind of the telco service provider side, you know, which is, you know, good stuff. Uh, same thing with uh, um, Cloud Native Compute Foundation has a, you know, IoT Edge working group and, and we see a lot of uh, uh, interesting stuff coming out of there. And so, um, you know, there's, there's, there's some overlap just in terms of the focus, um, but as we evolve things, we're, we're increasingly looking at how do we sort of cooperate. We all are better off if we kind of get to more of a harmonized you know, foundation. Um, so, so I think it's early in the process, um, but at the same time, you know, certainly the intent of LF Edge to go, you know, build that collaboration over time. And I, you know, I think the, the OpenStack community is the same way. I mean, these you know, community efforts are really, you know, about, you know, kind of that harmonization in general. That's the, the, the overall mission. But um, you know, I'd say it's early in the process um, and, and we're just kind of figuring out, you know, what's the best places, where do things need to be, you know, necessarily unique versus where do we want to kind of converge over time? I don't know if, if you know, Vikram or Matt, you have anything to add on that, but. No, I, thanks. I, I finally figured out how to go to Q&A open questions. Uh, sorry. <laughs> but yes, no, absolutely. I think as Jason pointed out, it's about the complete stack, open stack. So is a definite need in the market. And these liaisons between LF Edge and OpenStack will help promote building structures on top. But OpenStack itself cannot service like the lifecycle management structures we talked about or an IoT stack running on top, right? So this has to converge, and, and this is why we believe the Linux Foundation has a credible value in this. Um, well, and I'll add to that, you know, as running the State of the Edge project, um, I just uh, restructured my uh, steering committee, and I have a representative from Open, the OpenStack Foundation uh, on that. So we're very much trying to work in collaboration um, across all the open source uh, projects. Yeah, cool. Um, so I I, uh, I saw one, you know, it's, it's the old chicken egg problem. You know, right now infrastructure providers are waiting for use cases and use cases are waiting for infrastructure to be there on the edge. You know, how do we get the wheel moving? Is it chicken or the egg? Uh, I would say for, yeah, for sure, there's a lot of solutions looking for problems out there. Uh, and and I've, I've seen, so I've been doing IoT and edge kind of stuff um, for about five years. And generally speaking for me, it's if it's fuzzy, I'm on it, you know, technology wise. But and a lot of us, I think, in this, this community are kind of similar ways in terms of tech trends. But when you start seeing the use cases really emerge versus like the, the art of the possible and, hey, buy my platform. Why? I don't know. Uh, buy my platform. Just buy it. Just you can do something with it. When you start seeing it led by use cases to, to the, the, this question, that's when you see you know, the real value starting. And so I think that transition is happening now You know, because you know, it always starts with sort of the buzz. And we know there's a definite need for edge computing. But we're now starting to see people, even like IoT, which you know, started in 2014, we saw everyone talking about platforms, platform, platforms. And then the past two years, it's about business outcomes. <laughs> you know, and the platform is the, the trailing edge exactly to this point. Um, I think the way you get the wheel moving is, is number one is really think about how you, you know, first off, find a business case, find a use case. So it is, it is always should be led by an outcome. Second off, get aligned with the right stakeholders because, you know, any of these things around digital transformation is always a people problem and a use case, a business problem first, and then the technology kicks in. And then I think once you've kind of solved some of those issues, you've got, you want to start small, but make sure, you know, to the earlier points around architecture and this notion of open architecture and think about how you're doing things. It's not about like not latching on to one, you know, cloud or whatever. Again, they're doing great stuff, but just kind of hedge your bets by creating that uh, open framework in between because as the world starts innovating faster and faster, and that's kind of what this whole flywheel is, is happening, you know, more and more, um, you need to be able to pivot and you need to be able to bring uh, assets in from a, a ecosystem of experts and that, that, you know, know about a certain domain or have a unique app, some sort of value add over here. And so how you get started, you start small, but you architect for scale is, is kind of what I would say. And of course, focus on that business outcome.
Yeah, I'd like to add one uh, one little little twist to that, and that is, if you think of the internet as it exists today, it has largely been built through some percentage of forward deployment. Whether it was Amazon's putting service in the field or you know DARPA uh, connecting fiber, um, it's always been part of, uh, of forward deployment. So one of the things that's happening um, really at scale in 2020 are a, a lot of the capital investors uh, who understand that business model, you know, not Silicon Valley, you know, private equity and so on, are putting a lot of money into building infrastructure in advance of the applications. Uh, now, those, those spends are very strategic. You know, they're in the top cities and things like that. Um, but, I, but I think that it, it's a mixture of what, what uh, uh, Jason said, which is like, what's the business case? How can we start small? But also, there's just some critical infrastructure that has to be in place at a certain level of scale to catalyze this whole thing. And that's happening. That was my only point. Yeah, no, that's uh, very fair. Cool. Um, like go ahead, Vikram. Um, the infrastructure provider's market is going to evolve. The, the question is, what is going to trigger it? Right now, we see the B2B cases basically breaking that chicken and egg problem yep. um, you, you, you mentioned. Um, anonymous attendee, sorry, I don't know your name, how to address you, but um, that's exactly how it's going to move. We will see trends that, hey, um, does it make sense for me to actually host all these racks here when I have a nearby site I could go to, right? And they will provide a tenancy structure, which is solid. Then you'll start moving uh, not only from public cloud, the workloads, but also on-prem. So this, this movement uh, will anyways happen. It's just a matter of whether B2C commercial cases, which we, people often get excited about, will they directly move for public cloud? Probably not, but it'll take a step-by-step -step approach to get there. Yeah, and I, just to put a pin on it, um, exactly. And, and if you do these abstractions that we're talking about, and one of the key points of, of this community and, and you know, as we collaborate, you don't have to have all the answers today. You know, you're going to be able to pivot more effectively down the road as you, you, you might think, oh, up front, I, I can run everything, you know, at this edge. And, oh, actually, I need to run it over here. The advanced class is what I call the analytics of the analytics. And you start to kind of analyze where you're running things to figure out where's the best place to run it. But if, again, it's going to evolve, as, as I think we're all saying. And, and um, you know, if you think about architecture today and you start small, you can pivot as you go and you're not going to be locked into some silo. Um, there was another question I'm, I'm reading here. Uh, do you want to um, uh, talk, uh, one of you guys want to talk about the access edge um, you know, as the experts in this? Yeah, well, and I, I think Matt, I oh, think yeah. there was a question oh. that Matt wanted to address about. Oh, sure, sure. Federation. Yeah, there was a really, really interesting question. It was answered in text um, that I thought it makes sense to elaborate on because, you know, we're talking a lot of inside baseball here. So somebody asked, you know, hey, look, I've got a challenge around, I wanted to play an application across borders, US and Canada. Is there any sort of federated way to do that at the access edge, I think is a, a good summary of the question. And this isn't just Canada or US, it's global. And it's not just uh, across countries, it's across service providers in a single country, right? Like, how, how do I deploy an application nationwide if I have to deploy it on Verizon's network and AT&T's network and Comcast network and, you know, so on, just from the United States? So it's a real challenge. And I think there's, there's two forces that are coming together to solve this. One is there are companies that are working with the telcos to provide abstracted interfaces that allow you to uh, uh, call upon resources that span uh, you know, the, the, the business boundaries of the different telcos and, and cable providers. So there are companies that are working on that. And there's also um, the emergence of these peering fabrics that are extending all the way out to the, to the access edge, you know, these edge exchange points. And so you can imagine a world where you could you know, hand a, a container or some set of workloads to um, a federated uh, orchestrator that would then figure out how to run it on ser different service provider networks. But you can also imagine a world where, you know, like what Amazon and Verizon are doing, or maybe what Google and AT&T are doing, where there's an Amazon server, um, you know, a, a, a rack away from a Verizon baseband unit. Um, and so you can run something on an Amazon server that then has a very, very low latency access to that last mile network. And both of those models are, are emerging. Um, there's going to be interesting trade-offs and, and uh, you know, business debates and, and challenges there. But I think that's, that's how this federated problem is going to be solved. It's going to be solved from the cloud providers down and server providers up. Great. Thank you. So I think we are actually out of time um, unless there's um, any last thoughts that anyone wants to share real quickly before we wrap this up. Um, no, this was great. And thank you. This was an awesome effort for the last six months. And most of the people engaged have open source code here. Um, so we will continue this trend. I think this is the first attempt we have made to harmonize. Hopefully one 
thing you might be able to get it is that we are not talking about like thousands of these standard bodies. We are actually making it simple for people to understand what this entails, right? So we are not using three-letter acronyms anymore. <laughs> <We're talking> TLAs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and I, I mean, yeah, yeah TLAs, okay. three-letter acronyms, yeah. Uh, but thanks all, this was great. Yeah, the last question, you know, it's, you know, the state of the edge, the glossary, let's, let's kind of start to kind of congeal around a common, you know, uh, set of terms, you get away from the loaded terms, and then, then go focus on value, I think is the kind of the, the net here. And um, we think the white paper, you know, download the white paper, we'd love to hear your feedback, but, you know, we really think it's going to help, um, you know, shape the conversation a bit better, because, you know, again, a hard, you know, inherent technical trade-offs, not loaded terms. Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us today and participating and engaging. I think this was a, a really useful discussion and thanks to all our panelists and thanks to everyone who helped with that white paper. Again, uh, please go and download it. Um, we will be sharing the link over Twitter and email as well. So if you didn't catch it in the window, um, there are multiple opportunities. You can also go to the lfedge.org website. Uh, there is a tab called resources and if you click that, you'll be able to find it that way as well. All right, have a great day, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.